It's January 2019, and prime ministers, CEOs, and celebrities are gathering in the Swiss Alps for an annual summit. A globalization backlash, growth in China, and trade tensions are dominating the agenda. Actor Matt Damon is also here, talking about the need to improve access to clean water. On the sidelines of the World Economic Forum, an American doctor and a British scientist are sounding the alarm about a different concern, the specter of a pandemic. In a press conference, Richard Hatchett highlights the mission of his organization, launched two years earlier to combat infectious disease outbreaks with new vaccines. Sitting beside two drug industry executives and the head of a health charity, he says the risks are rising. In our hyper-connected world, epidemics have the potential to hop from continent to continent, spreading far beyond the places where they emerge. His group, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, is pushing to speed development of vaccines against a range of threats, including the coronavirus that causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. And there's more to Richard's strategy. We have also announced our first investments to tackle disease X the disease we don't know about, the emerging disease with the potential to cause a pandemic. One investment is in a program at Imperial College London. Led by Robin Shattuck, the research aims to create vaccines that can be scaled up rapidly to respond to outbreaks of those mysterious pathogens Richard sees on the horizon. The event in Davos is a prime opportunity to address some of the planet's most prominent decision makers. Robin sets the scene standing in front of a screen with images of people walking along a bustling city sidewalk. Now imagine you're standing in any major city in the world and there's an outbreak of what we call disease X, an unknown respiratory pathogen. How quickly could we respond? The reality is that for most countries, there's no regional mechanism that could manufacture and distribute vaccines in a meaningful time frame. Just think about that for a moment. But many people are thinking about a deadly pandemic, potentially triggered by avian flu, as a distant possibility, not an imminent one. Ebola killed more than 11,000 people in West Africa between 2014 and 2016. But that virus and others like SARS, MERS, and Zika had all faded from the headlines. Robin reflects on the prevailing sentiment at the time. The scientific community has said a pandemic is coming, it's coming. But having said that for you know at least 10 years, People were getting very uh, used to the drumbeat and, and not actually really appreciating the threat. So it isn't exactly a packed house when the imperial scientist warns of a novel and potentially dangerous virus that could suddenly strike. There had been the experience with Ebola, um, but that was still relatively geographically isolated um, and wasn't a global phenomena. And so in Davos, when we gave the presentation, I think there were about 30 people in the audience um, and uh, none of them of uh, particular uh, levels of influence. For years, scientists had issued warnings and urgent calls to bolster our health defenses. And at times, those red flags captured the attention of global leaders. Richard's coalition, known as CEPI, is a testament to that. But when disease X hits, just months later, many countries aren't ready. Despite success in creating vaccines in record time, COVID-19 exposes the world's vulnerabilities, killing millions of people and triggering economic turmoil. Two years in, the pandemic still isn't over. A fast-spreading and heavily mutated variant, Omicron, is the latest twist. But virus hunters are already planning for a future crisis, one that could be just as bad, if not worse. And they're pointing to lessons from the past. While a number of pathogens are on their radar, the effort also depends on anticipating threats they haven't seen before. I'm James Payton, a health journalist at Bloomberg News. From the Prognosis Podcast, this is Breakthrough. Richard Hatchett didn't set out to protect the country from pandemics. At Vanderbilt University in the 1980s, he was an English major and a poet. Later, he opted to go to medical school before focusing on treating cancer. Then, A turning point comes on a bright, late summer day in 2001. News outlets like CNN 
interrupt their coverage. This, Justin, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers. A second hijacked plane slams into the South Tower, and soon, New York's tallest buildings collapse. Thousands of people are feared dead. Richard, an emergency room doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, is determined to help the city respond to the September 11th attack. The next morning, on Wednesday, he and other volunteers hitch a ride on a truck down the West Side Highway and head to the smoldering ruins at Ground Zero. It was really shocking. There obviously was this just pulverized dust coating everything. There were cars and and things that had been abandoned. I mean, I think I remember seeing like a baby carriage that was just completely coated in white dust that clearly, you know, the parent had picked up the child and had fled on foot. It smelled poisonous and toxic in in a way that I've never experienced before. Richard's group moves a few blocks north to a field hospital set up at Stuyvesant High School. With few survivors, nurses and doctors are providing medical support to search and rescue workers. Richard is asked to take over. Hundreds of volunteers arrive in the next 12 hours, and the young physician is energized by the teamwork he witnesses. That was obviously a a personally transformative moment. Very powerful, overwhelming in some ways experience. Also remarkable to work with the the medical volunteers, the, the nurses, the doctors, who had shown up, very dedicated, self-motivated, used to taking accountability. But he's also frustrated by the lack of organization. Little prior thought had gone into harnessing the skills and talents of civilians. No one seems to have thought that anything like this could happen. After three days, he hops on the subway uptown, slowly making his way out into a new world. Along the streets are photos of New Yorkers who are missing. Leaving Friday morning and emerging back into this shell-shocked city that was just devastated and silent and had a, a, a gaping wound in the skyline. I was inspired to you know, draw on the experience we had, but think about what would we need in the future if something like this happened again? How could we be better organized? How could we be better integrated? Terrorism is now America's most urgent priority. But the threat is changing shape quickly. When letters laced with anthrax begin appearing in the mail, biodefense suddenly emerges as another pressing concern. Richard is set to begin a cancer fellowship at Duke University. After 9-11, he changes course, devising a plan to form a network of medical volunteers who can be mobilized swiftly in emergencies. Not just terrorism, but other health crises like epidemics. The concept catches fire. Within weeks, he and his colleagues are briefing the White House. President Bush's endorsement follows. And in early 2002, Richard heads to Washington to help set it up. I took a complete right turn in my career at that point, you know, deviating from my plan to complete an oncology fellowship and to go on and practice medicine to to do this odd thing that didn't seem to build on anything that I'd done before. What Richard doesn't realize is that his idea, initially sparked by fears of domestic terrorism, would take on increased importance in the coming years and put him on the ground floor of global efforts to battle biological threats. When you decide you need to prepare the country for a pandemic, how do you make that happen? And how do you persuade a complacent population to brace for a possible catastrophe? A pivotal policy 16 years ago starts with a book It's 2005, and George W. Bush's worries are expanding. 9-11 had already been a defining moment. Hurricane Katrina is another unexpected disaster. Anxieties over an avian flu strain spreading in Asia are also running high. Then, the president learns about a pandemic almost 90 years earlier that killed tens of millions of people worldwide. Richard is working at the Infectious Disease Division of the National Institutes of Health. The president happened to read John Barry's book, The Great Influenza, uh, which was a history of the 1918 flu, and it you know, really scared him. And here was a natural threat that had a potentially an impact that you know, was catastrophic beyond anything that uh, you know, terrorists could do. Bush elevates the issue to the top of his agenda, calling for a national pandemic influenza strategy. Putting it together, 
falls on the shoulders of Rajiv Venkaya, the president's advisor on biodefense. Bush believes many parts of the government and economy aren't focusing nearly enough on that kind of nightmare scenario. Here's Rajiv. He didn't see that they were part of this, and yet he knew that they would be affected. One of the assumptions we made in pandemic planning is that up to a third of your workforce could be out of work at any given time because either they were sick or at home taking care of somebody who's sick or because they're scared to come into work. Rajiv is looking for backup, a strategic thinker with a medical background. So he contacts the office of Tony Fauci, head of the Infectious Disease Unit, and asks for Richard. Rajiv knows him from projects they'd worked on before. What I asked for and was allowed to pull together a team to work on the implementation plan for the National Strategy for Pandemic Influenza, he was one of the first people that, that came to mind, and, and we asked for him by name. And so I had to make the difficult call and request to Tony Fauci to get him to release Richard to be a part of our pandemic flu efforts. And of course, Tony um, saw the, the importance of it, and, and he, he agreed, although I'm not sure gladly. Bush's plan takes shape quickly. In late 2005, he explains the rationale in a speech televised on C-SPAN, proposing more than $7 billion in spending. At this moment, there is no pandemic influenza in the United States or the world. But if history is our guide, there is reason to be concerned. The president is determined to pick up outbreaks earlier, expand vaccine production, and boost readiness at the federal, state, and local levels. Waiting until a lethal pathogen emerges could have devastating consequences. And one day, many lives could be needlessly lost because we fail to act today. By preparing now, we can give our citizens some peace of mind, knowing that our nation is ready to act at the first sign of danger. But the foresight isn't fully appreciated at the time. And the U.S. commitment to tackling those looming pandemic risks, it's inconsistent after the Bush years. Richard continues to worry with roles on Bush's Homeland Security Council and the national security staff under Barack Obama. In 2009, the new president is forced to contend with the swine flu pandemic just months into his term. The spread of Ebola in Africa poses another test. The Obama administration was quite good at learning from its experience and and adapting to the reality of the world that it lived in. And it it did elevate uh, global health security as as one of its priorities. Uh, But I think it was driven to do that by you know, what happened in the world, not, not because it was a priority from the beginning. Obama's team drafts a 69-page document, a pandemic playbook, outlining how to respond to deadly viruses, and leaves it behind for the Trump administration. Richard spends several years at a U.S. biomedical agency that works to spur development of vaccines, drugs, and other countermeasures. Then, in early 2017, another door opens. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations is launched, and Richard is lured to run it. CEPI has influential backers. It began with almost half a billion dollars in funds and support from a few governments and big foundations like Gates and Wellcome. But keeping pandemics front and center proves difficult. Swine flu turns out to be less deadly than people feared. Ebola worries ebb. Much of the focus is on the Trump election and Brexit. Elected officials and governments probably discounted the threat. When we talked about the pandemic threat, and talked about the huge global cost of a pandemic, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of people kind of secretly were like rolling their eyes, thinking that we were just fear-mongering. I don't think that I'll have that problem going forward. At the end of 2019, less than a year after that meeting in the Swiss mountains, officials in China begin investigating a pneumonia outbreak an unknown virus that's spreading fast. Within days, scores of researchers get to work on potential vaccines to combat the pathogen, a new coronavirus. Pfizer and its partner BioNTech sprint out of the gates, along with another company, Moderna, which has been collaborating with the U.S. government. Those drug makers are betting on a technology called messenger RNA. Richard has been tracking progress in that field for years. So when he receives an email from Moderna CEO Stefan Bancel on January 20th, he doesn't need long to reply. The biotech company is seeking funds to move its shot into human trials. I, I think we basically made a decision in about seven minutes. I, Stefan's email was like, you know, whatever time it was, 8 o'clock. And at like 8.07, I was responding saying, yeah, I think we should do this. Let, let's, 
proceed. But we knew the company, we knew the technology, and we knew the urgency at that point. They sign a contract just two days later and unveil it the next morning back in Davos. And that was actually, I, I, I believe, a week before WHO even declared the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. That's how quickly we were making decisions and moving. The vaccine race is on, and most people know how it plays out. In a remarkable feat, Pfizer and Moderna create highly effective mRNA shots within a year. The University of Oxford and AstraZeneca also crossed the finish line using a different technology, building on work to develop a shot against MERS, the other coronavirus threat. But gaps in surveillance and testing allow the virus to take off. Many governments respond too slowly. As cases climb, the Trump administration is blasted for ignoring the pandemic strategy it inherited. Here's Obama speaking at a campaign rally in Philadelphia in October 2020. We literally left this White House a pandemic playbook that would have shown them how to respond before the virus reached our shores. They probably used it to, I don't know, prop up a wobbly table somewhere. We don't know where that playbook went. Wealthy nations, meanwhile, rush ahead to snap up vaccine supplies, leaving poorer regions behind and unprotected as the highly contagious Delta variant spreads. The inequity of the distribution of vaccine in particular, but also the other countermeasures, oxygen and the therapeutics that we have, to me, that's the central story of the pandemic. It's also the central moral failure of humanity in our response to the pandemic. Richard says a program known as COVAX is helping to right those wrongs. He was part of early discussions that led to its creation. The initiative aimed to deliver vaccines fairly to every corner of the planet, but it struggled to access doses and fallen short of its goals. Wealthy governments and pharmaceutical companies have faced criticism for not doing more to narrow the divide. Next time, the world will need to spread vaccine technologies and manufacturing capabilities more widely. Petro Terblanche is trying to make that a reality. She directs a Cape Town-based biotech company called Afrogen Biologics and Vaccines. The business is working with the WHO and other partners on an mRNA hub to produce new shots and train people from other countries to make them. They aim to reproduce the Moderna vaccine, a product that's failed to reach large parts of the globe and have a candidate ready for human trials in about a year. But they're looking well beyond that project, hoping to put lower-income regions in a stronger position in the future. Here's Terblanche. And it's part of a, of a global initiative to ensure that not in, only in the short term, but in the long term, low- and middle-income countries have access to mRNA technology platforms, and that low- and middle-income countries are able to sustainably manufacture at least a significant portion of the vaccines that they require to ensure health security. This is not a one-year program. This is not a five-year program. This is a 15-year program. A year after the first COVID inoculations arrived in rich countries, many African nations have yet to fully vaccinate 10% of their people. The glaring access gap during the COVID pandemic has fueled calls to boost manufacturing in developing nations and help those regions become more self-sufficient. Africa imports more than 90% of its vaccines. Petro says the past couple of years have been painful, but she's optimistic that new technologies and increased investment will have a lasting impact beyond COVID. The biggest lesson for us is that um, we cannot rely on the rest of the world to provide us with health security when the rest of the world are in a pandemic. Um, it is the it's the it's the selfish gene that you must never underestimate. There's a rude awakening that this 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 can this cannot be repeated ever. In the West African country of Senegal, a new production plant is set to become part of the solution as well. By the end of next year, the proposed facility at the Institut Pasteur may start making 25 million vaccine doses a month, targeting COVID and other diseases. It's backed by European countries, the U.S., the World Bank, and others. Amadou Saul, the veteran virologist who directs the institute in Senegal, says the plant could spur more investment and become a model for the continent. Uh, This is not a project only about making vaccine, but also it's a great opportunity to build a future. 
And I hope that the, the younger generation won't have to face what we're facing right now. Amadou has spent decades urging people to prepare for outbreaks. After the Ebola crisis, he received a painting as a gift from his wife and children. On one side is a family shrouded in darkness, threatened by a looming virus. The other is filled with bright light, a symbol of the science that will save them. He put it on the wall of his office in downtown Dakar, a reminder of his mission. We should be conscious that we may have other COVIDs. They may not be necessarily COVID, but they may be influenza or another new disease. And the world should be prepared for that. But people are talking a lot about having a new normal, meaning that we would have to cope with uh, living under some condition because the, the, the epidemic may be something very regular we have to take into account. As Amadou says, Africa, along with the rest of the world, will be tested again. Coronaviruses, influenza, and a slew of other pathogens are on scientists' watch list. Then there are diseases that aren't yet known to infect humans. The next ones could be tougher targets. Scientists may not be able to easily replicate the COVID success story, work that benefited from previous investments in targeting coronaviruses. Despite decades of work, there still isn't a vaccine for HIV, as Imperial's Robin Shattuck knows well. The danger is that something new comes along and people expect it's solved within a year, and it may just be a a, a bigger challenge for the scientific community. Robin's experience also underscores the complexities of vaccine development. After falling behind, Imperial decided not to go forward with a larger trial this year, lacking the budget of a big pharma company. Instead, it's refocused on variants, booster shots, and refining its approach. Their technology may not play a role today. The hope is that it will in the future. In September, a university spinoff Robin co-founded attracted AstraZeneca as a partner. Imperial's method, called self-amplifying RNA, shows potential in stimulating strong immune responses with very small doses. Messenger RNA vaccines temporarily turn the body's cells into vaccine-making factories. This could be part of the next generation, if Robin's team can prove it works. The technology could reduce manufacturing costs. In a pandemic, it could allow supplies to reach vast parts of the world. If we can meet that challenge of of very low doses, it completely changes the uh, productivity um, and will enhance global access. So if you can make 30 to 100 times more vaccine, then you're going to have just way more doses to, to go around. Another goal is avoiding the need to freeze or one day even refrigerate RNA vaccines during shipping and storage. That could remove an obstacle for immunization campaigns in developing countries. The rollout in low and middle income countries has been tragically slow and we can't continue to live with this kind of two-phase approach where rich countries get vaccinated very quickly and are already thinking about boosters where you know low-income countries just have had perishingly few vaccine doses. Richard now wants to draw on those lessons. One part of the plan is creating a library of prototype vaccines targeting up to two dozen viral families. That could provide a crucial head start in battling future outbreaks when they arise. Scientists are also working on experimental all-in-one vaccines that could offer broad protection against multiple coronaviruses, not just the one that causes COVID. And Richard wants to move even faster on vaccines, potentially developing them in just 100 days, a moonshot ambition. We can see a pathway in perhaps as little as as 10 years of focused work to radically reduce the risk that these diseases present, you know, for the future. And and if we can do that, we'll live in a much safer world. Still, the next pandemic could happen sooner than we think. Rising populations and increased travel can allow viruses to spread quickly. Encroachment into natural habitats, swelling cities and wildlife trade raise the likelihood of diseases jumping from animals to people, And researchers say climate change is expanding the range of disease-carrying insects, like mosquitoes. There there are a number of trend lines that would increase the risk of of future emerging diseases. And all those trend lines are long-term trends, and they're all heading in the wrong direction. So I think what we're dealing with is a, 
a category of, of threat that has not been discharged because we've now had a pandemic. That doesn't buy us another 100 years of safety. Vaccines are just one tool, along with expanded monitoring and sequencing to track mutations. Artificial intelligence and data analysis are also critical. Sally Davies, England's former chief medical officer, is on the front lines of that effort. Last year, she formed the Trinity Challenge, a coalition that's funding promising projects all over the world, from Europe to Asia. Technology companies Facebook, Google, and Microsoft are members. We came together saying, never again. We asked people to engineer the collision of data science with public health, to answer the questions by producing innovations that can be scaled, that can become public goods, affordable in low- and middle-income countries as well, to really make a difference to, can you pick up spillover earlier? Can you clamp down on an outbreak? Can we respond better? Can we recover better? One recipient of Trinity Funds in Thailand arms local farmers with an app that allows them to quickly flag emerging diseases that could pass from animals to humans. Another is using AI to analyze billions of annual blood tests to try to pick up epidemics early. Those initiatives could give governments an edge in preventing local outbreaks from exploding into something far worse. The former UK health official is focused on a number of risks like influenza. She also worries about a different kind of pandemic, one that's moving more slowly than COVID, but killing hundreds of thousands of people every year. I am very concerned about antimicrobial resistance, the superbugs, the bugs that develop resistance to the treatments we use, whether it's bacteria, to antibiotics, viruses, to antivirals, fungi, to their treatments, which is a slow and silent pandemic that's rising steadily up. Money and expertise are important, but galvanizing world leaders also requires tenacity. In 2014, Sally Davies pushed then-Prime Minister David Cameron to take on superbugs. <laughs> well, my husband once said, when I was chief medical officer, the senior people probably thought they'd appointed a doctor who would tell them the evidence. What they didn't understand was they got a campaigner who was a doctor who would tell them the evidence. And the evidence on antimicrobial resistance is powerful. It wasn't strong enough when I realised we needed, as a world, to move on it. So I went with our cabinet secretary to see the then prime minister, Cameron. I said to him, it's as complex and complicated as climate change. She and her colleagues moved the issue out of the realm of technocrats, as she puts it, and into the public eye. A report that came out of this effort found that without any action, drug-resistant diseases by 2050 could cause up to 10 million deaths a year and have massive economic costs. It's not too late, but we must take action or there will be many dead because you, the politicians, haven't committed the money. You, the companies, haven't made new drugs. We have not set up surveillance systems. Here I am, banging on still, seven, eight years after I started. People tend to believe the future will look like the past. So how do you prepare for something you can't imagine? Here's Rajiv again. The former Bush advisor now runs the vaccines business for Takeda, the Japanese pharmaceutical company. And he's also on the board of CEPI. The swine flu, or H1N1 pandemic, should have been a warning. Instead, because the fallout was limited, Rajiv says it led people to relax. This is a real concern that people's imagination will be limited by their most recent experience. Uh, the, uh, the H1N1 pandemic, paradoxically, probably drove a level of complacency around influenza. Now COVID will likely be seen as a worst case scenario given the massive health and economic pain it's caused. But we could see a similar story play out again. And it's possible a future contagion could be even more devastating, combining an ability to spread easily with a higher fatality rate. The virus that causes COVID is much less lethal than SARS and MERS. Another worry is a disease that severely afflicts groups beyond the elderly and those with underlying health conditions. Take the 1918 pandemic, the one that frightened President Bush. People between 20 and 40 years old were hit hard by that virus, as well as younger and older populations. I 
see plenty of reasons why COVID could be far from the worst uh, pandemic that we could face. And battling dangerous viruses could become more difficult as governments and scientists confront distrust and a divided population. Frankly, my biggest concern coming out of this pandemic is the undermining of confidence in public health authorities and the scientific community that we've seen driven by misinformation and disinformation. And that is not something that's going to be corrected overnight. Countries cannot afford to let that persist. We're, we're going to have to have a comprehensive strategy to deal with, with misinformation because in the absence of that, we will have a uh, chaotic response as we've seen in many parts of the U.S. and that will under, uh, ultimately lead to far more people getting sick and dying as we're seeing today than necessary. Rajiv says health officials need to take advantage of the focus on COVID to step up development of vaccines, therapies, and testing technology. There's no guarantee that whatever we do is going to eliminate the pandemic threat, to be clear. But there's a lot that we could do to be more prepared, not just for flu viruses and coronaviruses, but for viruses from other families. One key is messenger RNA. It's a bright spot amid the misery of the past two years that bodes well for the future, bringing the benefits of speed and flexibility even if traditional methods will still be needed. Nations also must broaden their efforts to keep up with both old scourges as well as new enemies. Richard says Nipah and Hendra, the deadly paramyx of viruses, are expanding their global range. And they're just a couple of examples. We got out of the gate like Usain Bolt in terms of responding to coronaviruses, and we're not ready to do that with other viral families. And there are many other viral families that present concerns. We need to be as ready for paramyxoviruses and and for, you know, the other 24, 25 viral families that are known to cause human disease as we were for coronaviruses. 20 years after 9-11, Richard again sees an opportunity in the wake of a disaster. He envisions a world in which pandemics are preventable in the same way famines are no longer inevitable thanks to early warning efforts. But achieving that will be a massive challenge after COVID-19. I am very concerned that, in a sense, as, as damaging and disruptive as it has been, as many millions of people as it has killed and as much economic damage as it has caused, which is in the tens of trillions of dollars probably, that COVID may just be a shot across the bow, that there is ahead of us in this century a pandemic that would make COVID look like a mild pandemic relative to what is possible. For now, the priority is getting COVID under control and grappling with the risks posed by variants like Omicron, taking advantage of the innovation that emerges from the pandemic, strengthening the WHO, and boosting funding are seen as important next steps. That spending to try to avert a future calamity, it would be tiny compared with the potential cost. If we stay focused, and, and leverage the political will that COVID has generated, I think we can dramatically reduce or even eliminate the risk of future pandemics if we want to. And I think we have to, because I think they're an existential threat to, to modern society. It's a message governments have failed to heed in the past. Will the world assume that this is a once in a century event and let its guard down again when COVID finally recedes? Or will we see this pandemic as a wake-up call? The health and economic stakes couldn't be higher. This episode of Prognosis Breakthrough was written and reported by me, James Payton. Topher Forges and Magnus Henriksen are the senior producers. Carl Kevin Robinson Jr. is our associate producer. Our theme music was composed and performed by Hannes Brown. Rick Schein is our editor. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like this episode, please leave us a review. It helps others find out about the show. Thanks for listening.